Yes. So, quick recap. Martha was married twice, first to Daniel, he dies. They have two children before he dies though. And then she remarries George. George raises the two children as his own. Martha dies at 17. John gets married at 19 to 16 year old Eleanor, and they have four kids. Good? Good. Okay. So, they get married, have four kids, and then the Revolutionary War is happening. George Washington is the general for that, so he's off fighting in the war. And John here is an aide to George Washington during the war. However, unfortunately, he dies at the age of 26, the same year that his son is born. So his son is only about six months old when his father dies from Camp Fever at the Battle of Yorktown. So now Eleanor here is pretty distraught. She has four little children now to take care of. Martha here, also pretty distraught. She had four children, two died in infancy, and then now her other two children have died as well. George is off fighting in this war. She's alone. Nobody's really all that happy. So Martha agrees to take care of the two youngest grandchildren and raise them as her own, as well as George. Once again, now George is raising a second generation of Martha's children. So when George becomes the first president of the United States, it included Martha, George Washington Park Custis, and, Ellie, and Nellie. So that's why we have this famous portrait here that is in every, in every history textbook, textbook. We have old George and old Martha. And then you see these two little children. Biologically, that wouldn't make a whole lot of sense. However, it's the grandchildren that are in the portrait here. So we have Martha, Nellie, George, and Washi, as they call him, because George Washington Park Custis, and we have George Washington here. Kind of confusing, you know, call him St. George. So, they called him Washi, and uh, time goes on, they're a happy little family. They stay in contact with the other two daughters, they stay with their mom. Um, so, it's kind of a distant family thing, but it's not like they were excommunicated from the family because they didn't live with George and Martha. But Eleanor here gets remarried and goes on to have seven other children with their new husband. Um, so lots of kids for Eleanor there. But after George and Martha die, they receive their inheritance. They receive quite a bit, all four of the grandchildren, from Martha, because she still has everything from him. None of the kids survive, so she can't pass anything on to them. So it goes to all four grandchildren. So that means that George Washington Park Custis received three properties. Two plantations outside of Richmond, off the Funky River, and then this 1,100-acre plot of land. Um, he decides to turn this 1,100-acre plot of land into a memorial to George Washington. George, he really idolized him quite a bit. He moved to Mount Vernon when he was only about three. His dad dies when he was not even a year old, so the only father he knows is George. So he builds this memorial to him. Well, if you're going to have a memorial museum to somebody, you have to have things in it. George Washington's Mount Vernon does not go to Park Custis because his name is Custis. Mount Vernon is a Washington property, so he will never be able to inherit it. Even though he grew up there, really loved it, he can't get it. So it goes to a nephew, and the nephew doesn't want a lot of the items in the house, so he auctions them off. And so George Washington Park Custis sees this as a way to build what he liked to call his Washington Treasury. And uh, he did. He went into debt buying all of these things that he wanted for his Washington treasury, his deathbed, curtains, silver, china, war tents, correspondence, literally anything and everything that George and Martha touched, he wanted it for his collection. So he has all of this stuff and he's living on this 1100 plot of land. There's no house here yet. So he lives in a little shack down by the Potomac River, and down there, down by the river, it's damp and moldy, and animals are there, and you just spent all of your inheritance buying all of this stuff, and it's now being destroyed. So what does he do? He comes up to the top of the hill here and builds the part of the house where we are now sitting. He built it with these rough beams, basic brickwork. It was built by just the slaves that he brought with him. There was no architect why that door we walked down was a little short. Um, so he builds the house here that we're now in from 1802 to 1818. He builds it in a couple of different sections. 
builds the North Wing and the South Wing by 1804. Also by 1804, he has gotten married to his wife, and so the family lived in the North Wing here. But that does not mean that the architecture of the house for the North Wing stayed the same way the entire time the family was living here. It's changed and remodeled a couple times, and we'll see that when we go upstairs. It's a little strange and odd. But he has the two wings. Family lives here, guests live in the South Wing, and then you had the big open field in the middle. Well, unfortunately, he has all this stuff and a lot of land, but not a lot of money. So he used it all to build the two wings, and now doesn't have any left to build the rest of his house. So over the next decade, he builds that big colonnaded center section. And by the time he finishes that center section, his daughter Mary is about 10. So finally, she gets to move out of the nursery that is in the north wing here and up to her bedroom upstairs. Time goes on, they're a happy little family. And in 1831, she marries her childhood sweetheart, Robert E. Lee. Robert E. Lee spent quite a bit of time here when he was growing up. Supposedly, Lee and Mary here planted trees on the plantation together and played games in the, in the morning room. And uh, that's the Lee family spent quite a bit of time here because his father, like horse Harry Lee, made some bad investment decisions um, and left his family pretty poor. But Light Horse Henry Lee was also a cavalry officer for George Washington and knew of the Custis family. So they're all well connected. Everybody's distantly related to each other, like in Europe. And so the Lee family was invited up here to spend quite a bit of time with the Custis family. So they fall in love. They get married in 1831. He goes to West Point, or actually gets goes to West Point before he marries her, but he goes to West Point, and the only thing that he brings to the marriage that he has is that West Point education and about $3,000. But he is a civil engineer. He graduated second in his class with no demerits at all. Uh, pretty darn good record. I think he only missed first by a point or two. Not very much at all. Um, but he was a very good engineer for the U.S. Army and has posted a lot of different places around the U.S. Mexican War he fought in. He designed some state lines rerouted the Mississippi River for St. Louis, a couple other things as well, built some forts, trenched some rivers, all the good stuff that civil engineers do. So since he is posted all around, this, all around the country, she travels with him for the first year or so of their marriage, and their first son, George Washington Custis Lee, is born down in Fort Monroe, Virginia. Shortly after that son is born, Lee gets a transfer back to Washington, D.C., and they move back into Arlington House here, the two of them move into her childhood bedroom, and they stay here until 1861. The rest of the seven children are born in that childhood bedroom, back in that dressing parlor, and uh, they live happily until 1861, when Lee decides that he is going to fight for the Confederacy and switch after 32 years of Union service. Since he does that, it means his family cannot stay, and so they have to leave. Mary helps pack up the house, and they move further down to Richmond, different places all around Virginia, fighting for the Confederacy. Right after she leaves, about a week or so after she leaves, this becomes a Union Army base. It was called Fort Whipple. It was the main defensive position for Washington, D.C. We all admire that lovely view outside. It was also a lovely view back then, and you very well could have, the Confederacy very well could have, put cannons on the hill and bombarded Washington, D.C. So to avoid that, the Union Army took this over at the start of the Civil War and used it as a defensive position. So a lot of the items in the house were not here, but some of the items were, and so they were destroyed, lost, stolen, um, but some of them were returned back to us as well. But in 1864, uh, Montgomery Miggs, who was quartermaster at the time, decided as a way to get back at Lee for switching to the Confederacy, is going to start turning it into a cemetery so since 1864, there have been soldiers buried here on our own team. Pretty cool. Anybody have any questions? You said since 1864? Mm -hmm. Yep. Anything else? That was a lot of information I threw at you. You ready to go upstairs? <laughs> so the first person buried down the hill a little bit? So the first people buried in Arlington, so Mary, that Mary Randolph is a, a family a, related to Mary here. So that she is one of the wow. first people buried, but the first soldiers are buried down by the Iwo Jima Gate. Okay. And then the first Union officers are around Mary's garden. Can we go upstairs? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah.
Did Check. you want to scope? No, you gotta wait for the drummers. I'm gonna wait for the drummers. Okay. I'm gonna ask them my messages. What is wrong with my Oh, okay. It's back to normal. You guys ready? Okay. I'll show you guys. The kitchen over here. That's the kitchen. And we're gonna head upstairs. Here, I'll show you guys wine cellar real quick. Wine cellar. And we're gonna get head upstairs. So now, currently, you guys are standing on what was at one point an outdoor deck. It was eventually enclosed to the room that we currently see now, which is why we have an outdoor window inside of a house. Um, this is also the only part of the house where we will step up or step down. The rest of the house is all exactly one level. Since this part of the house was built first without an architect, not everything matches up the way that it should. So just watch your step as you come up here and down on the other side. Come on up here. Oh, they were just asking. Oh, okay. Wise. Right here, we have this double doorway alcove oh, sorry. thing, and uh, it leads into the family parlor. The family parlor is where Robert and Mary were married, as well as three or two other couples. That's the family they parlor. They are both slave right. couples, which make them pretty remarkable. But that is kind of the family chapel, it's where they said their prayers every morning and evening, and why yeah. there's a giant portrait of Madonna and child on the wall. If you look to the left there, you see a much shorter, narrower doorway. And that is the doorway into Mary's nursery. And that is where she stayed until she was 10. And Dad finally finished that upper section there. So do you see a crest? Or maybe we can ask her the questions. Yeah. How about yeah. that? OK. Even though she gave yeah. us the book. <laughs> <laughs> Any it says why why do you think she's oh, holding a green parrot? This room here was Look at the opposite page. Bedroom and his wife Mary. Um, they stayed here for the majority of the time they lived in the house. When they finished building that upper section, they moved upstairs. When the Lee family moved back in, they moved back down here to give each family kind of space of their own. At one point in time there were eleven people living in this house, which is quite a lot of people to be sharing just a few bedrooms. Is that a bathroom or is that? That is the connecting door to the nursery there. I don't know if I want to share a door with somebody when I was 10, especially my parents. But I understand when you're, it's like a nursery, it makes sense. Uh, but this is an original wall to the house, as I said down there, actually just out there. The architecture was changed a couple of times. So this part of the house was at one point two floors, That's where that big line across that center is. Two floors, and then this is the chimney space for that room upstairs, as well as for the room down here. And so that's also kind of why we'd have that outside wall there, that outside window there. The walls and rooms would have been different. But if you look closely, you even have some old wallpaper left on the wall as well. Once you've had a glance here, you've had a glance here. Watch your head as you walk through that very short doorway into the school room and have a glance at that exhibit there. on this easel, and it is where the Lee and Custis women taught the slaves to read and write, which is pretty darn brave of them, because at this point in Virginia, it was illegal to teach slaves to read and write, but they felt it was a skill that they should have for when they were no longer slaves. Very forward thinking of them. 
But the exhibit behind you is about one of the other couples that was married under that same archway as Robert and Mary. This is the Syfax family, and Mariah is the illegitimate daughter of George Washington Park Custis. She married Charles Syfax under that archway, and we believe that Mariah was his, his daughter because she received things that no other slave on the plantation received. He never officially acknowledged her, however. However, she did receive 17 acres of land, her freedom, as well as a cabin to live in on the estate right here. She lived over by where the Sheraton Hotel is currently, um, or actually just a little bit one way to the other, uh, but she lived over that way. But yeah, Mariah, in order to gain her freedom, she and her children were sold to a Quaker neighbor, Edward Stabler, who was, he was a, not for slavery, and so Custis sold her for one dollar, them for one dollar, the least amount of money he could sell them for, to give them their freedom because he was in debt. Since slaves were thought of as property, as a way to avoid them being taken as payment of debt, you sell them to somebody who you know will give them what you want, and what he wants, and everybody wins. So, yeah, and it's a way to avoid paying people for people. Um, so, that's that exhibit. We're going to head on. The Quaker Episcopalian uh, connection is pretty oh, unique, and you'll find that same um, thing going on all in Virginia. Mm -hmm. you know, the ladies here are very devout Episcopalians, very, very devout. identify slaves in photographs. A lot of them didn't even have first and have last names. So we didn't, so we were able to find them. It's incredible for us. Um, but Selena Gray was Mary's maid. Uh, we believe Mary and Selena had more of a friendship than a master and slave relationship. And it would make sense because your maid is going to know everything there is to know about you. So Selena was one of the slaves that was taught to read and write. And Mary and Selena stayed in contact with each other after the Civil War. Uh, let's talk about family stuff and friendship things. Um, but Selena helped Mary pack up the items in the house um, when they had to leave in 1861. And when Mary left, she gave the keys to the estate to Mary and told her to protect the items in the house. And when Selena found out that soldiers were going through things that they had stored in the attic, because they couldn't pack up three generations worth of people's stuff in just a few weeks, that's impossible. Um, whatever they couldn't take, they stored in the attic. When she found out soldiers who were staying up there were destroying and looting and every other good thing that soldiers do, she confronted the commander in charge and told him, your soldiers are destroying American history and you need to do something about it. Which, incredibly, he actually did. He saw the value of the items in the house and had them all packed up and taken over to the U.S. Patent Office in Washington, D.C., where they were stored for the duration of the Civil War. But Mary also gave Selena this cabinet, and uh, when Mary, when Selena's daughters found out that we were turning this back into a memorial, they returned it back to us and told us this is the exact location of where it was when the Lee family was living here. And if you look closely, there's a little ring right here on the cabinet, and Robert E. Lee used to like a glass of buttermilk at night, and so the slaves would leave it there for him. And then whenever they see that the glass was empty, they knew that they could retire for the night. But this was returned back to the family here. Um, yeah. We're going to go upstairs now. We're going to walk up the servant staircase. It's much more narrow and steep than the nice family staircase on the other side. This is where they would have 
walked up to take anything to the lead down the water. When you get up there, I want you to have a band where it looks around to see if you can figure out what you're doing in there. Thanks for that. the desk on the one side. Actually, both sides of that chair pop up to have a desk, which is super cool. I want one of those for my house. Um, but for a very long time, we believed that that chair there is where Robert E. Lee decided that he was going to resign from the Union Army, and he wrote his resignation letter in that chair in front of the fireplace. Well, one of our historians did a little bit more research and actually discovered that he wrote that resignation letter down in the green parlor, which is the very last room that you can up that staircase right before you exit the house. So interpretation does change over time, which makes it always an adventure. And then the doorway there, you see through the door and you see the chair with the, the coat and the desk. That is the dressing room, the dressing parlor. And that is also where Mary had those six children of hers. She had seven children in 14 years. <laughs> Never ever want to do that. Children. Yes, it is. <laughs> Crazy people back then. Eternal that. pregnancy. Um, but we have the room up to the right corner there. That room is much more masculine than all the other rooms up here, I'd say. And that is where the three boys stay. The house is restored back to 1861. So at that point in time, only the youngest son, Robert E. Lee Jr., would have been staying there. All three of the sons fought for the Confederacy during the Civil War. The eldest was an aide to Jefferson Davis. The second son was a cavalry officer for his father. And the third son really had no desire at all to go into the military. However, he enlisted as an artilleryman in 1862 and worked his way up the military ladder. Now we have the two rooms over here. They had seven children, three boys and four girls. And the four girls stayed in these two rooms. What do you think the rooming situation would have been? Three, 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 one, two, two, four, zero. What? Four, zero? No, not four, zero. But... What do we think? Take a guess. So these were the two girls' rooms. Right? Only the girls stayed in these. So it would have been the eldest daughter Mary had that room down on the on the front corner here with the two beds in, and then the three youngest daughters stayed in this bedroom here. But I 
there are two beds in that room. For yeah, that reasons. doesn't seem like it yeah. would, it would fit, right? That's because Mary had a, the family here had a cousin, Marky Custis Williams. Her portrait is actually up on the wall there. If you look closely, she's the, the little girl with the hat on. That's an original portrait. Um, Marky Custis Williams spent quite a bit of time here. And so Marky and Mary were friends. And if any guests came to the house, they would also stay with Mary up there. So that leaves this bedroom here as the three daughters, the three youngest ones. The bed that is currently in here is now a replica. How do you the family was living here? It was George Washington's deathbed. Good grandpa. You see, you have your daughter sleeping on, but I guess the bed is a bed back then. I don't know. But it's one of those items that George Washington Park Custis have bought for his Washington treasure. The room is kind of situated the way that it currently is because we have this sketch. This was a sketch drawn by one of the soldiers who was posted here during the Civil War. And we believe it is of this room here. And there's actually a couple items on this sketch that we still have in our collection today. Unfortunately, they're no longer in this room because we're closing the house in November and our curators meet and took them out. Um, but this would have been George Washington's deathbed here. Um, and my, I love the title of this sketch. It's This Cruel War, Roughing It at Arlington House. <laughs> Roughing it. I don't know why you could ever rough it here. <laughs> I think even when they took everything out of it, they could still never rough it here. Um, but this was this room here. Officers stayed on the floor here. The enlisted men stayed up in the attic upstairs. Just much warmer and kind of toasty and not all that fun to see. But are we interested in going up there? Okay. Oh, really? If you don't want to go, it's completely fine. You can hang out down here until we're next. treasury was stored that Selena confronted the officer about and was stored over there by the columns. And at one point in time, those columns were hollow. They're made of brick, not the stone that you would think they are. They're made of brick and they were hollow. And one of the, the Lee boys, we're not sure which one it was, and was mad at one of his sisters. Again, we're not sure which one, but he was so mad at her that he took her doll, ran up the stairs here and dropped her doll down one of the columns. So now that doll is now forever entombed in one of those columns because we've now since filled them in the concrete, make them a little bit more sturdy. Um, but this is where those enlisted men stayed. Bet there'd be a lot of them up here and it'd be pretty darn crowded. Uh, but as we walk back downstairs, you'll see some spots on the wall where there's no paint. If you look closely, you'll see some graffiti from the soldiers who are posted here. Also, if you look up at the two beams right above the door, you'll see some graffiti there as well. So, whenever you guys are ready to go back downstairs, feel free to do that. That closet area that I turned the lights on on the way up, so you can see some of the original brickwork. Oh no, I'm filming. <laughs> Is that a nursery or a playroom? 
room are probably the playrooms of how to do fast walks. Oh, I forgot to look for the graffiti on the wall. Oh well. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> forgot all about the graffiti. <laughs> Beautiful. Look at the chairs up there. And they even have their own little luggage <laughs> to travel with. Oh my goodness. It's amazing. Do you see this? Um, can you know what I mean? This, this is um, like needlework. That's what little girls oh, used to do. Oh, for needlework, right? Okay. And you see that's the yarn that they would use? My grandmother. Is that one? Um, that's the Outside of the back of the house, the very two windows on the very end, you'll see floors going right through the center. Wow. But it does make some it does make some sense on the inside of the house. Some made it here. They did let light like, into this made it here. hallway staircase here. But like the staircase down here, the closet. So it doesn't look so right. It does work for the community. There was no electricity. Um so we've actually done some hate testing, and so these are the colors that we believe were in here based on that hate testing. So who are you related to in the tree of furniture? And then in all of these rooms, not the center section here, but in all of the rooms, there's original flooring. So if you wanted to, you could walk on the same floor as Robert E. Lee did, or Mary, or Mary, or Fitzhugh, or any of the other Lee children. When you guys are ready, we're going to head back down the staircase here. Well, thank you for the attic. Oh my god, that was awesome. <laughs> done by a guy named James Ward. It's a pretty popular painting in London, and we believe Custis saw the engraving in a book or a magazine, since I guess he was painting these mur other murals at the same time. You can paint whatever you, up on, what, whatever you want up on your wall. I don't know. But this wall here, we've done paint testing, never had a mural on it. He did the other three, but never finished it. Why? You have no idea. Huh. Okay. We're going to talk about this portrait here. It's my favorite one. I love talking about this. It's so quirky and weird and strange. 
So we have, that's Daniel Park Custis, and then we have Martha Dandridge Custis, and then we have John and Martha, their two children. Well, John here would have been about three at the portrait painting, and Martha here was a couple years older than her, than him. But I don't know a single three-year-old who has a receding hairline <laughs> and looks pretty darn close to what Dad looks like up top there. And then we have Martha here. You put Mama Martha up to Baby Martha. You notice a resemblance there as well? Pretty darn close. And so he was a very rich Virginian landowner and everybody knew it. She was a very pretty young lady. Her family also had quite a bit of money. And so these two children would have inherited all of that. So it very well could have been the painter and the family wanting to make the statement, these two children will be the next generation of the Virginia elite. So look out for them. Be prepared for what they're going to be doing. But the guy who painted that one, this one, and the one of Martha, the guy named John Wollaston, he had a very distinctive painting style. He was only in the U.S. for about a decade. Um, but we have here, we have a different family, a different state. Wow. Again, it's almost the same portrait. Yeah. And uh, we believe he did something. He was an itinerant painter. That means that you can paint whenever you can. So uh, conditions were not always ideal to paint. So we believe that he went around with headless bodies and families would choose which headless bodies they wanted for their children. <laughs> so it would be very easy to tweak this portrait to have her holding a doll rather than flowers and very easy for him to put a different bird in his hand. Kind of creepy, but also kind of cool. I always like to rename this one 1700s Photoshop, or even face swap, because yeah. that's what it is. <laughs> Have you guys gone through the rest of the house already? Would you like me to take you through it? What would you like to do? We didn't see these two from this side, I guess. So we have these two rooms, the china in on this table, washing and china. Okay. They That's are coming fine. here still. Okay. That was the latest message we got over the phone. It's um, going to be the Farah Khan, Farafina, Farafina Khan, and they're going to do um, African dancing and drumming. That's what they're going to do. Okay, I got a swear you guys in. Dance Africa. The They're pretty famous. Yeah, so if you see them, it's um, pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> and there is George Washington. There Yeah, 
Inferno Daniel Park. Hi. <laughs> They're getting their badges too. Awesome. So they're getting their oh, junior yes, ranger band. Isn't that exciting? Yeah, we have to show junior Cindy rangers. <laughs> Cindy's a naturalist, but you'll have to, you'll have to show her next weekend. Cindy, we have to have a proper ceremony because there's like four inductees. Yeah. Right, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yep, just put your names on the back of your book. Okay, excellent. <laughs> So thanks for joining um, the tour. We're going to wait outside for the um, dancers and the performers. So thank you guys so much for um, joining and we will see you shortly. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I'm glad you enjoyed it. And I'm going to have to go back and look at the comments. So have a good one. Ciao. What is that? CISO. What does that mean? Is that your name? Oh, ciao. Typo. Ciao. <laughs>